and Christian Nunez uh, and Joel Siegel. And uh, who, who did I miss? Then jo uh, 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 we're going to do later. Uh, and then um, then we're going to have... Yes, well, we're going to do the uh, fundraising pitch, and then Danny, Sarah, and Tatanka will speak. Okay? So it goes uh, uh, Mimi, um, um, uh, Dolores, uh, um, Mena, Christian, Joel. And, but Joel, you'll come up and introduce um, uh, Mena and, and Christian. And um, uh, I will... Uh, uh, Tatanka... Tatanka, can you introduce Dolores? Would you please? Tatanka Bricka will introduce Dolores, but I get to introduce Mimi. Okay, so Mimi Kennedy is uh, beyond description. She is a magnificent activist, and uh, uh, I, I refer to her as Bridget because she is Irish, as as you might guess. And um, she is uh, she has been. In, uh, I looked at your uh, film list; it's fantastic. Yeah, you've been in a lot of great movies. So uh, she's most recently in Mom, uh, playing a magnificent, really, I mean, a, a great character that only you could do, really. I mean, you have so much empathy and wisdom and grace and, and charisma. I mean, it's a magnificent. And she is in Midnight in Paris, totally out of character. The character you played in Midnight in Paris is exactly the opposite of who you are. <laughs> I and mean, you pulled it off tremendously. But she is as committed and as brilliant and articulate and effective as any activist I have ever met. So Mimi Kennedy, I can't say more than that. It's wonderful and speak your heart out. Thank you, Harvey. Sluggo. Sluggo and Bridget. That's our <laughs> nickname. Um, wow, I, I have notes, you know, because it's been a pandemic and it's been a long time since we've been together and I've been able to address a crowd live. And I, like many, have been reflecting during the pandemic and I wanted to get my thoughts together and be very specific about what I talked about today. And uh, several drafts later, I don't know if. I have exactly what I wanted to say, but my heart is in this, and thank you for listening. I want to welcome everybody who's going to listen online. I want to thank Jan and Jerry for hosting us again. This is really hallowed ground where many a progressive action has taken root, and here we are again, thank God. Harvey, thanks for convening us. I got a chance to read some of your book in galleys, and all I can say is it's making up for a rather dismal education in American history that I got in parochial school in the 1950s and 1960s. I didn't really know my American history. Between you and Tom Hartman, we're fixing that. Um, I just want to say, uh, many of you know, PDA was launched in 2004 as an anti-war organizing to bring the peace movement and justice movement inside the Democratic Party. And we did it because we knew our nominee, John Kerry, was not going to take opposition to the Iraq war into the campaign. And even the veterans wanted that war to stop. I remember the event, our first fundraiser ever in LA was me, Sally Field, Hector Elizondo, in an anti-war play by Tony Kushner that had only ever been published in The Nation. But we did it on stage, it was shattering. And Tom Hayden spoke and Tim Har uh, Carpenter, our great founder, spoke. That was the launch and Keaton Simons, who was uh, Lila Garrett's grandson and she joined our advisory board, he sang Masters of War, and the last line Bob Dylan wrote in that song is, and I'll stand over your grave until I know you are dead. Well, they're not dead. People are being blown apart. Cities are being destroyed as we speak. It's happened in Yemen. It's happened in Iraq. It's happened so many places, uh, uh, Miramar, is so many places. And our PDA advisory board members, Media Benjamin and Co uh, Jody Evans, have been stalwart in reminding us that ideas and violence, feelings, they don't die. You can't bury them like a body. So you have to be creatively nonviolent with your life and your time and your energy to oppose those ideas every time they surface again and try to stop the expression of those ideas in violence that does murder bodies and that does create more hate. 
We lost the 2004 election. One month after that launch, we were very hopeful. And of course, we all felt to some degree, and the media was only too glad to pile on, that it was because the Democratic Party was divided because, you know, John Kerry wasn't anti-war enough. Well, yeah, okay. You know, we were trying to work that out. But then we thought, wait a minute, we really lost because of one state, one state, Ohio. And when some activists went to look and see whether we really did lose Ohio, guess what? Unlike Georgia and Arizona, there was not paper to look at to prove the win or the loss. No paper. There was paper in some counties. We could have looked at some of it. But by the time that case wove through the courts and a judge said, OK, you can look at the paper ballots, the counties that had the paper ballots, the few, had destroyed them with impunity. Nothing was ever happened. Nothing was ever done about it. So the worst thing to me about this Stop the Steal movement, other than they hijacked the term election integrity, so I don't feel I can use it anymore, is that where were they when you could really steal an election with impunity and there was no way to check it? It's been going on since 2002, and I never heard a peep from the Republican Party because they were really happy gaining and holding power. Now, what did the Democratic Party do? Progressives went, oh my God, we're con we, we have people who support us, we're popular, but it's not showing up by fractions of percentages in state legislative races, in congressional districts, just enough to tip the balance of power. And the Democrats would tell us, now don't question our elections, it's paranoid, it's democracy, and you're gonna undermine confidence. Well, we've learned since that another word for confidence, for short, is con. And if you're naive, and if you're not vigilant, and if you think that you can trust people who show you that they will win by any means necessary, means that you don't want to take, like violence and theft and deceit, you're going to lose to them. So the progressives really got on board with this. Dolores, Worth, I see you nodding. And I want to thank you publicly for being one of the first great national activists that understood the fix that we were in. And you lent us your support back when it was convincing to Congress. Anyway, one of the uh, worst, one of the silver linings, if, if there was any, to the past four years and the degradation of the presidency, of our politics, of America's moral character, though I would say some of the things we did all through the 2000s uh, managed to do some of that too. Well, it was that in the ruthless behavior of the executive and a Supreme Court that wanted a unitary executive and a Congress that didn't want to do anything but follow the uh, uh, commands of this unitary executive, we saw what ruthlessness was. And I think during this pandemic, Republicans have had a chance to reflect. They even want honest elections now because they understand without them, they really, their sins will catch up with them and they will be consigned to the dustbin of history. <laughs> My father was a Republican. All right. Um, one of the things that we see, uh, progressives, by the way, unlike Stop the Steal, where they were nowhere to be seen. We were in the courts. We were in, as in Ohio, as in John Brakey will tell you what he did. We were in Secretaries of State's office. We had a great one here, Deborah Bowen, that restored the paper ballot early 2006 to California and started the trend nationwide and gave us wind beneath our wings. We were on, con uh, uh, on ca Capitol Hill. We were everywhere begging people to see we need to restore paper ballots or we're going to lose the republic. They finally, finally started to listen because they did think for a while, well, didn't the election of Obama prove that there's no more racism in America? Really. That kind of naivete and, uh, was what allowed the Republican Party to pack the Supreme Court with the people that gutted the Voting Rights Act. 
Chief Justice Roberts says there's no more racism in America. Look, we have an African-American president. That was done by these tiny incremental shifts in paperless elections, and our party, unfortunately, stood by with too much trust when that happened, and progressives were brave in being smeared and ridiculed and rejected when we tried to restore the paper ballot, but we got it back. So we have an infrastructure now that we can use to make the people's voice be heard. Now what do we see? Because the only way that you can suppress a real majority from showing up in election results is by, with paper ballots, making sure that paper ballots aren't cast by the majority. We have to make the majority look like the minority and the minority look like the majority. And now they have to do it old school, the old racist way. Really stop people from voting. It was easier inside the computer, it was clean. There was nothing to prove the lie. It was great, you know? And Americans would vote on these computer voting machines and they didn't even realize the danger. They were sold a bill of goods. Oh, it's so fast. We're voting on computers like I use at work and at home. Oh, my county government has become technologically savvy. This is forward progress. We had to fight all of that attitude. And while this red shift they called it, went on while Republicans took over state legislatures. The message to Democrats was, you're not popular, you're so fractious, you're not united, and God is not on your side. And we didn't have the money, the AM radio stations, those got bought up real quick, and Rush Limbaugh made conflict and politics a blood sport and got tons of stations, money, Fox News did the same on the people's airwaves. That should never have been sold to Rupert Murdoch. I don't really know how that happened, but that's how we got hornswoggled with Fox News. And then everybody piled on 24-hour news cycles that sells conflict and violence as the thing that's gonna keep you watching because you're nervous and you're in conflict with yourself and we're telling you everything is bad. And at the polls, we couldn't get the majority to show up because in incremental little jurisdictions, you could steal without paper as much as you wanted. That's what we're correcting now. I wanna talk about the degradation of the candidates who rose to power and are holding power under these deceitful circumstances where they were convinced they're popular, the other side is not popular, they're godless Democrats. We saw it in the hearings of the most brilliant Supreme Court nominee. I can remember, Ketanji Brown Jackson. And those three Republican senators, Cruz, Hawley, and Graham, mm -hmm. tried to smear her with repetitive wallowing in child pornography. And this was not a surprise to me because when you followed the Ahmad Arbery trial and at the last uh, final arguments, the defense lawyer for the three murderers said, four murderers, well, the long, dirty toenails of Amon Arbery. And I remember commentators going, what's, what's that have to do with anything? How strange. Lawyers knew it wasn't strange. There's a legal strategy. They teach it. Try to attach something disgusting to your opponent. It's a subconscious feeling emotion. It's one of the deep, fundamental human emotions. And it will attach to your opponent, devalue your opponent's humanity. And your listeners and the people who are doing that devaluation of your opponent don't even know it's happening. Just get in something disgusting. That's what those men tried to do to this brilliant judge. And they succeeded only in attaching the disgusting trigger to themselves. I will never think about them again without thinking about how much they enjoyed bringing up child pornography, ever. And Judge, uh, Judge Brown Jackson emerged unscathed. Yeah. So if the Republicans gave a damn about children, they'd have passed the Build Back Better Act. Yeah, they were so worried about the cost, but they're not worried about the cost during the tax cuts or during a war or during gun violence, discussions of how much that's costing us. They're just worried when it comes to helping families and children. 
So I want to blanket the media this year with the message that it's Democrats who protect children because we've wanted all along to protect the planet. You know, I weep when I see tornadoes taking out whole communities in the heartland, or when I see floods making river areas and coastal areas uninhabitable, and now the parched farms because it's too hot and the water has gone to fracking. There were people who were trying to spare us this. They were trying to prevent it. They saw it coming, they believed the science, and they brought it into their campaigns and they got defeated by this message that we're godless and we want to uh, it, destroy the purity of the nation and its children. Wrong. We want planetary survival and we want the human experience to thrive, experiment to thrive, and democracy and nonviolence is the only way forward and elections are the nonviolent moment of golden opportunity. It was also Democrats, mostly, who warned that the continual buildup of a nuclear arsenal was not going to keep us safe. And what do we see now? War in Europe, brutal aggression, and what ties our hands? The nuclear arsenal. So it was never something to make us safe. We now know it's just an arsenal of suicide. We tried to warn, we've wasted a lot of money, and diplomacy is the only way forward. I know that diplomatic solutions don't please everybody, but it gives us time to raise children and to educate ourselves and to reflect the way the pandemic gave us time to reflect if we were lucky enough to survive it on what it means to see human development, to see our loved ones thrive or struggle even, but in our own homes where we love them and we learn from them as to how to live without violence. So that's my last thing. I want to say that take this reflection from the pandemic, take heart in the fact that progressives have won the infrastructure back. It's not perfect. John Brakey will talk to you about how he is still going to preserve it more accurately, but we have come far. And we are popular because democracy is worth saving, earth is worth saving, life is beautiful. Those of us who get to know it that way, while other people are being blown apart and we see it, that is a painful mystery, but I believe it is that pain that fuels our activism. Because what we know to be beautiful, we want to share. As I said, elections are the nonviolent golden opportunity We've restored the infrastructure, use it or lose it. Alan tells me we're gonna revive the voters calendar for 2020 that was so popular and effective. It's a big research job, 6,000 counties and states, all their details and deadlines, websites where you can check up to the last minute that you're not gonna fall into a trap that they've just set for you. Elections are not just election day, election season and you have to make a plan. The media picked it up, the DNC picked it up. From us, the progressives, Steve Rosenfeld, shout out to that journalist, he helped us so much. Um, and make a plan to vote. That, that began here, pretty much. So we, our vision, is to let the people's voice be truly heard don't let the right divide us this time. I believe many of us have been lucky to see children come into our lives, especially during the pandemic. <laughs> and uh, we see, I believe that babies come into the world thinking they've won the lottery, regardless of their circumstances. This is it, a human life, a chance at self-actualization, self-experience, knowledge, further knowledge, maybe even a chance to, to make amends, maybe a chance to do some kind of nonviolent, even joyful justice in the spiritual and the physical universe. Democrats are trying to save the planet so that can keep happening. So thank you for having that vision with me, holding it, and let us kick ass this year. <laughs> Thank you.